if at any point I drop out, I will make sure I come back in. Um, but we're doing some filming in Edinburgh, which is always, always fun, um, Mid Fringe Festival. So thank you for joining today. It's really good to see you. Today is our co research meeting that's focusing on experiences of Parkinson's disease and access to or exclusion from clinical trials. But before we go into that in too much detail, um, have you all already introduced yourselves? Or are we cool? Right, okay, fab. Um, so I'm Rosie and I lead patient and public involvement or partners in research for the Dementia and New Progressive Network. And I've done various bits of co-research um, in terms of involving people with lived experience. And so that's kind of how I came came to be here. And we'll, we'll let Mark in so that it can also be heard. Um, I think the best thing is probably just to go around the screen if that suits everybody and just ask you to introduce yourself, say who you are and how you ended up here is probably the best option. Um, Helen, it's actually you first. Okay, so hi, I'm Helen. I'm the administrator for uh, the Neuroprogressive Dementia Network, and it's me that emails out uh, <clears throat> to you all the time. So welcome along. And Rose, you're next. Hi everyone. I yeah, I I've just introduced myself to Joe, but um just to everyone else, um uh, my name is Rose. I'm based at Edinburgh Uni, um, which is how I know Rosie. Um she supported me with my research that was exploring young onset dementia. Um I've got a background in kind of mental health uh, services, but I'm now working in the dementia field and particularly interested in how we can involve lived experience in research and make it a more equitable kind of partnership. I'm kind of new, so it's nice to meet everyone. Thanks, Rose. And Joe, you're next on my screen. Good morning, everyone. So I'm the secretary of something called the Dundee Research Interest Group, um, which is a Parkinson UK supported um, group for um, people with Parkinson's, members of their families and researchers to work together. And um, Mark is on the group with us. In fact, he really helped to set it up and was the first chair. And my husband, Brendan, who has Parkinson's, he was diagnosed at 57. So he's had it for seven years now. Um, he chairs it now. And my father also has Parkinson's. He, on the other hand, was diagnosed in his late 70s um, and has quite advanced Parkinson's. That's making my caring for my parents quite difficult now because it's very difficult for Brendan to go to see all of that, you know, looking at where his life might be going. Um, but we had a very exciting time at the start of this year when Brendan had the opportunity to join a trial. Um, so I've learned how fantastic the Clinical Research Centre um, at Nine Wells is and what supportive staff they have and how well informed you become. Um, and unfortunately, Brendan decided to leave the trial because it suddenly seemed that his Parkinson's drugs weren't working as well. And we thought it was maybe to do with the trial. And then we thought it was to do with something else and so on. But actually, I think it's just because he's been on them for seven years and we're kind of now disappointed that he left the trial. But I hope that I can bring some of what we went through with all of those decisions um, because he has a genetic mutation. So obviously he really wanted to contribute to research because of our children. And my dad has Parkinson's and my mom's mom had Parkinson's. So we're kind of in the firing range for potentially quite a lot of different genetic con uh, contributions. So I'm really looking forward to hearing about all you're doing and I love the presentation. I'm not sure who is responsible for putting that together, but it um, seems very sensible. Uh, thank you so much. And it's really great to have you here and as I say, a wealth of experience, um, but also hopefully it can be a, an enjoyable experience for you to be involved in to um, get that, that shared experience. Uh, Nicole, coming to you next. Hi everyone. Uh, yeah, my name is Nicole. I'm the uh, research involvement lead at Parkinson's UK. So I head up our patient involvement program uh, and um, so I'm involved in a lot of different projects, a few projects with Mark um, involving working with pharmaceutical companies on clinical trials, ensuring the patient voice is embedded. Uh, very nice to meet you, Joe. I think I've heard quite a bit about you and your, and your, and your husband and the work that you're doing in the, in the rig. So uh, yeah, nice, nice to meet you as well. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Hi there, folks. Um, I'm not sure I can have the same level of experience as Joe's obviously got with all of our experience. However, I was diagnosed with Parkinson's, I think it's now 11 years ago, and um, been taking the drugs ever since. I've also participated in a clinical trial 
with uh, has spent a lot of time with Jackie in uh, the Western General in Edinburgh, uh, getting huge syringes, which must have been about that length, and uh, keeping them in the fridge and injecting myself every week. So that was, I'm hoping to get the results of that clinical trial fairly soon. I'm also the chairman of the Edinburgh branch of Parkinson's UK. We run a whole range of activities almost on a daily basis now. We've got the Edinburgh Parkinson's annual lecture coming up in September, which I'm sure a number of you have signed into. I'm also a member of the Edinburgh Research Interest Group, which is how I got really involved in um, Parkinson clinical trials. And my hope for today is that Mark's not driving as he's on this video. I think that's a fair hope and probably something we should have checked, but I assume not. <laughs> Mark, we'll come to you next. Um, I'm not driving, but I'm in a car moving in uh, north of Fort William to go and look at the site in connection with my work. So I could be cut off any time. I apologise about that. Um, so I'm Mark Van Grieken. I've been, I was diagnosed with Parkinson 20 years ago and um, I've Certainly, the last five or six years, no more than that, I think seven or eight years, particularly concentrated uh, promoting research and participating in anything that will increase the number of research projects, increase funding for research, and increases awareness of uh, Parkinson's across the, uh, the country and further. Because, uh, as we all know, it is a growing, excessively fast growing continent of people who will develop Parkinson at some stage. And I think the world isn't really woken up to the economic and other costs this makes, this will have on society and on us as individuals, but importantly also families. And I think, Joe, you, you catch that extremely well. So um, I will try and do whatever I can recently to promote research. I'm absolutely fortuitously, very fortuitously, I took part in a trial since the 19th of December 2019. I will never forget that date. Uh, the trial is coming to an end on the 2nd of um, September. And it was for Pro Duodopa. Now you've all heard about Pro Duodopa, it's been on TV, etc. And for me, it has been a transformation because I walked with a stick four and a half years ago and I don't anymore and haven't done. I couldn't sleep more than two hours. I haven't I've sleep, sleep every night quite happily. So it's been absolutely transformational, and uh, it's just an example of how, in this case, a drug can help quality of life because it doesn't it doesn't actually do anything to slow down or uh, deal with the condition itself, but it greatly improves quality of life. And uh, I wish that on everybody on this call and everybody who knows me with Parkinson's. So I think that's probably long enough. But uh, as I said, if I drop off, I'll try and get back on. <laughs> but Depends on local. We're also, because we're recording it, Mark, don't worry. If, if you drop off and then you want to, we can make sure that you're filled in on anything you miss. Um, but it sounds like a lovely trip. I'm a little bit jealous, to be honest. Um, that sounds great. And last but not least, Jackie. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Jackie Kerr. I'm the Neuroprogressive and Dementia Network Manager. Uh, I'm on the call and I'm joining and being part of us because I have been involved in uh, delivering and facilitating, coordinating, being part of clinical research for 18 years now. So um, I'm really keen to be part of what we're discussing and how we can make things better, take things forward. So that's why I'm here. And as Stephen says, I know I'm uh, quite well. So we've spent a good part of two years together of every three months, every six weeks, just kind of getting to know. And uh, yeah, so that's why I'm here, because I've got a really, um, I'm heavily invested in research and have been for a long time. So glad to be here. Thank you, Jackie. Um, I think what might be helpful is just to kind of recap where we've got to so far with kind of this group. Um, and, and the kind of direction that we are kind of considering heading in, but also as as with all these things, we always try and keep it very open to actually, if you think, no, we're going in the wrong direction, we need to take it back and go a slightly different way, then um, we can be as flexible as possible to that. But we also want to make sure that we're not um, repeating anything that we know is going on elsewhere, because then we're just doing two lots of work for no reason. Um, but also making sure that what we hopefully create together and the work we do together um, has a, an impact both for us, but also then for the, the wider 
wider community of people. Um, so this group came together um, for several reasons. One of the reasons being that we partners in research developed to try and involve more people with lived experience in research activities. But just because of, I suppose, some of my background, a lot of that had been quite dementia focused up until um, that point. And we wanted to make a really kind of concerted effort to recognise actually that we had a lot of people um, affected by Parkinson's who were either involved in clinical research or interested in clinical research. And I think um, at the time of setting up this group, we had about 70% of people on our permission to contact register. I'm now worried that I'm throwing out a statistic that's completely wrong, but I think it was about 70%. Um, have I totally made that up, Helen? No, you're right. Yes. Okay, about, so about 70% of people on our register um, were affected by Parkinson's or, or, you know, linked to Parkinson's. So I think it really showed that we needed to put some kind of concerted effort into how do we involve people um, with lived experience of Parkinson's into the work we're doing. As a network, we're in quite a, a unique position in many ways that we're kind of running clinical trials in Parkinson's as well as having these groups of trying to involve people in the kind of research and research related activities and trying to make sure that the experience of research is as good as it can be um, and Mark as you were saying about the the potential for quality of life depending on um, what research is available to you and hopefully groups like this are about being as inclusive as possible because we know that some things will be available for some people and not others but we want to make sure that everyone has space and a voice um, as much as possible. So that being said, we have spent the last couple of meetings partly getting to know each other and, and talking about areas that we think are important and uh, important to reflect on. And a particular interest that's kind of come up as a kind of a bit of a group consensus has been around. Originally, what we talked about was what happens for people who would like to be part of clinical research, but are not able to be. Uh, not eligible for for whatever reason but we also then talked about actually experiences um like Stephen talked about where actually you might be eligible and you might be involved in a trial but what happens when that suddenly stops or when that stops and you maybe don't get access to the um, medication afterwards and that that can really feel that you've been kind of dropped and 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 left kind of out in the cold after having quite a lot of um contact so we kind of broadened our thinking so that it was not just about people that wanted to be involved but couldn't be, but also people that had been involved and either um, it had stopped or um, the drug was pulled early and all of the different things that can happen. Um, before I say anything else, I just want to check, Helen, is, are you able to check that Joe is okay? I'm going to try and fill it in again. Cool, that's fine. Um, so that was kind of a, a lot of our early thinking is how do we how do we make sure that people in this position are supported? And and I suppose as as NHS staff, as network staff, um, people like myself and Jackie, it's really important that you know we can make sure the experience of being involved in research and and when we offer people clinical trials, we want to make sure that people have as much support as possible around that. And it felt like there was a real gap, I suppose, in and what do we offer people to make sure that there's that understanding? We then kind of moved slightly further with that and talked about managing expectations of clinical trials in particular, managing expectations of what the trial looks like, what it what it could involve, um, how much time it might take, the commitment it might take, but also managing expectations of what might happen at the end of a trial. Um, and I think uh, I'm going to use you, you as an example, Stephen, but you talked a bit about that kind of things you wish you'd known at the beginning um, compared to at the end and how that might shape your decision making and, and the, the choices that you make around clinical research. Does that sound about right if I'm representing that correctly? I think that's pretty accurate. Yeah, good. That's, that's a good idea. Um, and so I suppose where we've moved to next or, or partly what this meeting is about is thinking are there things that we can create as a group are there things that we can work on collectively that we could make available then to people interested in clinical trials or doing clinical trials in Parkinson's disease 
that would make their experience of being a participant better um, and hopefully make the experience of trials ending more positive. Um, but also recognising that, you know, there's a lot of hope that goes into being a participant in a clinical trial or even um, us putting yourself forward as a potential participant. You know, you're really you're hoping for something that can help, something that can make things better. You're hoping for whether it be for yourself or the next generation. Stephen. I think there were three things. I think as far as clinical trials are concerned, it's a well-trodden process. I think getting involved in clinical trials and during the clinical trial is well documented. It's well managed. It's well run by the people who run the clinical trial. I think the two areas that are maybe not quite so well managed are, first of all, those people who get turned down. <clears throat> how, <clears throat> excuse me. How do we look after? Or how do we communicate? Or how do we? What's the process for managing people who don't get onto the clinical trial? And I think you're right. At the end, being aware of what's going to happen at the end of the clinical trial is uh, sometimes quite difficult for people like Jackie because these things start and finish at different times. So I happen to start early and finish early, but the the clinical trial is still going on. And I guess maybe up front more communication about that is likely to happen so don't expect a sudden magic wand to appear on a particular date because that's not the way it happens and a bit more around about that so first to recap then the running of the clinical trial i think always works very well i think there's enough documentation enough process enough people who've been through that to say that's not really a problem the issues i think are at the very very beginning when people get turned down and at the very very end when you don't know what's going to happen that's absolutely it. Thank you, Stephen. Um, and I suppose part of the reason we wanted um, people like uh, Nicola involved, um, which I've realised you've got your hand up, so I'm going to let you speak before I say on your behalf why we think it'd be helpful for you to be involved. No, 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 you go ahead, Roy. I, I, I've got a very specific, more of a specific point, so I don't know if you want to, you, uh, you want to make your point and then I can come in. Yeah, so part of what we kind of talked about as we were doing this was making sure that um, we don't um, reinvent the wheel in terms of what other organisations are doing, but also that we look to share knowledge and work together. Um, and so the opportunity to potentially work with things like Parkinson's UK to create something, a, a resource, um, is is definitely at the forefront of our mind in terms of kind of the hopefully the impact of these conversations and of the work that we do um, but i'll let you come to your specific point oh, yeah i just want to add that i completely agree with steve and i think um and i agree with your point as well that there are quite a few resources for the during trial um state um but uh, i'm actually working on a specific project at the moment um uh, for a trial that took place for which was a surgical trial for gdnf uh, which is a neurotrophic factor and it was um there was a whole host of issues uh, with that trial uh, and there was a whole uh, series of patients who have come together to now put some resources together so one aspect of that and the paper that we're writing is post trial support because the, uh, these people took part took part and then they, it was like falling off a cliff edge it, it, there was no support uh, and they didn't know what to do most trials don't have budget for after the trial finishes so then what happens to them in terms of their support so these are all things that we've um, held a series of workshops for now bearing in mind it is bespoke in the sense that these are for this is more specific for surgical trials but i think there are points that can be uh, that can be put across the board for any clinical trial for uh, neurodegenerative uh, disorders. Um, so just to make the group aware that we are working on that and we're trying to publish that in the Journal of Parkinson's and the Lancet, uh, that will be for pre-trial, during trial and post-trial support. I think that the couple of points that we've come up with, that the group have come up with, the GDNF Involvement Advisory Board, is that uh, clinical trials don't usually have support like psychological and social support and emotional support during trials. It's not normally built into a protocol, but if you've got something that's very, very invasive, if you've got tubes going into the brain and then things like that, that requires an added level of support that a normal maybe a drug trial may not require. So that's the, uh, the support package that we've built and potentially maybe other uh, clinical trials in the future can incorporate that. Um, so yeah, just a few points for myself. 
yeah, absolutely. I think that's really helpful, um, firstly, to know um, what's going on, but also how hopefully any work that we do could complement that, um, as you say, whether it be in the kind of um, slightly wider um, perspective of different types of trial, um, but also something we've said from the start is that actually I think a lot of what we're, we're suggesting might not just be about Parkinson's trials, but actually might go across the different neuroprogressive conditions. Um, and I suppose where, again, being the network comes in, where we've, we've got kind of those uh, uh, representatives of people with Huntington's, with m and with MS, that there could be a lot of overlap. Um, and I think it, it's interesting in terms of you know, as it has a standard clinical trial, currently you don't they don't necessarily have to say here's the the emotional support we've put in, here's the the packages. And actually I suppose it's whether if we can build resources that people find helpful, whether actually there becomes a an evidence based argument for actually why that should be included and and actually that that becomes the norm that these things um are integrated. Um and actually a conversation I had with Rose yesterday the day I think was about that kind of how you could take the next say we say we create this resource the kind of next step of that is a in a research perspective is almost saying having the same trial where some people have the resource and some people don't and you look at the benefit potentially or not of having had that um, and whether that would be doable in a way that wouldn't impact the trial itself obviously because um, then you've got a whole different load of questions and risks but actually it's something that we could say having this available made the quality of the experience different potentially um and so i think it will be if firstly it would be great if you're able to let us know when when your work is published because obviously we we do want to make sure that that anything we do is um is complementary to that and not um not in any way kind of clashing with that um because i think as we as we so often know, one of the big things we need from research is that collaboration across organisations rather than a kind of competitiveness and resource where we say, well, we're all going to do it our way, um, even though then you're just creating multiples of the same thing, um, which wouldn't be helpful. Hey, Matt. Hey, Joe. Sorry that um, you had to I'm drop so out sorry. There. Yeah, no, I, my laptop suddenly decided to update my version of Microsoft Teams, so I'm really sorry about that. <laughs> That sounds about right. Yeah, it, it chooses its moments, doesn't it? Oh, um, very annoying. <laughs> and I imagine your signal might be getting patchy as you go further north there, Mark. Yes. We just... Oh, look at that. Open oh, road. Ten, ten points for anybody who guesses where it is. Not a clue. My knowledge of Scotland is appalling for someone who's lived here for 10 years. Oh, and this feels like a pub quiz. S Stephen, looks like you might be able to work this one out. You're on the A9? No, I'm on the A82, just about at the bottom of Loch Ness. We're just about to enter the area where the Caledonian Canal starts. Yeah. All right. So if we now see a monster, then we'll all be able to verify. This is being recorded, you know. We, we, might, uh, <laughs> we might commit history. Um, we were just talking about um i think think just before you dropped off, we were talking about um the work nichols been doing around um trial support in its surgical trial wasn't it nicole you were saying um and how anything that we create as a group we want to make sure um complements that work but also um that we can look at that kind of broader perspective um so all that being said from what we talked about um, we decided that it might be helpful for me to kind of squirrel away in the background and try and create a bit of a template of, of somewhere to start because I think sometimes when we think about support for clinical trials it's such a huge um, kind of area that it can be hard to picture what that might look like or what a resource might look like um, and that we thought having a bit of a template might help us start adding in things that we then thought would be helpful. Um, so this is when we rely on technology and hopefully Joe's experience is not indicative of what's about to happen. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but what we've created so far um, is a bit of a kind of summary document of some of the things that we started to talk about. Um, I should say this is very much 
kind of a first draft of what something could look like. This is in no way uh, any kind of final product. This is just to give us a a bit of an anchor to what we could work on. Um, so I am in absolutely no way precious or offended by any preferences or changes. Apparently there's a fireman, but we're going to assume that's a test rather than anything else. Um, I'm expecting that I'm expecting I'll get a call if it was actually leave the building. There we go. Um, we're so used to tests now that I'm not sure I'd ever know if it was a real one at this point. Um, so, as I say, not precious about the design or anything. It's just a, a bit of a template that we've put together. Um, and I don't know if Helen, you want to just flick through it slightly so we can get a bit of a bit of an overview. Um, so thinking of things that we could have um within this document and i know we talked um we've talked about how there's actually a fair amount of work done on kind of what a clinical trial the procedures of a clinical trial um seem to be relatively well covered for some people and not others um but the kind of depth that we go into could vary um from creating kind of similar guides to this in the field of dementia one of the things that we kind of had found helpful is that ability to have everything quite well sectioned so that you can use it as a bit of more of a kind of pick it up and go to the bits that are relevant to you while recognizing that there might be bits that you go, yeah, I don't need, I don't need to know what a lumbar puncture is. I've I've got that um sussed. But for someone else, it might be helpful to have that, but potentially having as much information in in a single guide as possible. So at the moment, what I've included is just some of the key topics that we talked about so kind of setting the scene of who we are and why we've done this but then um looking at helpful questions what a clinical trial could look like and what we want to see obviously what i haven't included at this at this point is that real focus on um that kind of managing expectations and things we wish we'd known um but it's something that then we could build on um next slide helen bit of a the classic put, put our faces I have meant to update it with Rose's picture because Rose is now new to the group, um, but something like that so that people um, know who's in a group is always always handy. Um, we'll go to the next slide so it's not just my face. Um, that's no problem at all, Stephen. Thanks for letting us know um, that you not, you'll need to leave early. Any Anything that comes up, as I say, we'll have it recorded and we'll make some notes. Um, this is just a reminder of who we are, um, obviously. You, you're already all aware of that, so that's fine. Um, and then I suppose this is that kind of why we're doing this. And we've talked about this at the start of the meeting about how we ended up here. Um, so then it's about how we start potentially building in these more kind of research specific questions and thoughts. Um, and the, the long line of images is actually going from kind of lumbar puncture scans, infusions, right through to social research that looks at you know observations and looks at um questionnaires and focus groups and things like that um at the moment it's all crammed into one to give an idea of what we could talk about i'm not suggesting that you necessarily have it all crammed into one it's again just to give you um an idea of the things we could explore um and i had quite a lot of fun googling images for these different things um and then this we talked about and Nicole has spoken about there too, these kind of different stages of a trial um, and I suppose different stages at which people might need support. So whether that be people coming in at pre-screening, so that bit before you even start a trial with that hope of maybe I'll be eligible um, and whether you are or not and, and the impact of that. Then you've got the next level of screening where you've got I suppose a bit more hope and a bit more kind of a bit more testing and a bit more a bit more steps into whether this could be for you but then you still don't really know if you're going to be on the trial until that real randomization point where it feels like okay trial started and and off we go um but then things also happen so it's it's hard to know but it was just kind of starting to think through what those steps look like um I think that's the, is that the final slide on that Helen Cool. OK, so we can come off it just now. Um, Nicole, you've got your hand up. I just had a, a very quick uh, point. Uh, so on one of the slides, um, 
you had uh, uh, you know the, the potential um, knowledge base around lumbar punctures and and all the different bits. Uh, I don't know if you're connected with um, Cure Parkinson's at all, Helen Matthews, who runs that organization, but they uh, run a series of uh, surveys with the Parkinson's community around their feelings around lumbar punctures, around different aspects of trials, which are trying to, at the moment, pull that data together to then inform clinical trials. So it might be worse, you know, when, when we're getting stuck into this project to connect with them a little bit as well to see if there is any data that can be used and that could inform the clinical trials uh, here. But I think, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a nice uh, overall um, booklet or, or, you know, I think it nicely, clearly um, outlines the, the group's work. Um, there was one other point I wanted to make, which was on, it'll come back to me. It'll okay, come back but, to me. But, but that, that's absolutely, that's really helpful to know. And I, I think um, if we imagine this, this guide or whatever we call it as being a kind of physical thing but also um ideally a kind of online version interactive version it would be great to be able to link that like, literally directly link to some of these organizations and the work they're doing and embed some of that so that it's that real kind of uh, group effort um and to make sure that we're recognizing that that was going on so that's really great to know that that's there um, it's come back to me. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. Uh, uh, the, the point was that the the series of clinical trials that you guys are, you know, that that's part of the NBN uh, network, is the idea that uh, this resource would uh, be useful for that array of clinical trials. That that's where you'll be looking at. From the uh, from a starting point, because uh, the point around if someone's not eligible for one trial, one aspect would be to keep them on board with research is to offer them another trial that's within your portfolio of projects. So uh, maybe yeah. uh, just looking at it from that perspective as well, because there are quite I think that what is it thirty odd projects that you guys are looking after the network. Uh, that's when I look at Jackie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm probably I'm probably in then some at the moment, um, including all the disease areas we're looking at. So there was a there's a whole plethora of studies going on at the moment, and the whole plethora coming in just a bit every couple yeah. of days. So yeah, I totally agree. I think yeah, absolutely. Uh, when one person might not be eligible for one study, they we we try because obviously they're so interested and keen to take part. We try and you know make make sure that we we do end up we. I have to say we do a lot of detective work right at the very beginning to make sure it's the right person for the right study. And if, for, if they're not uh, particularly eligible for a study, we would all, always then look to find if there's something else they're eligible for, but not to the point that we were hounding them with all, loads of stuff. You know, we're very careful about how we manage that. Um, but yeah, we have to do a lot of detective work. I'm basically like Miss Marple when I'm looking for participants for a specific study. So, but we make sure that they're the right person. For the right study because there's no point in you know putting someone in when we know further down the line that uh, some illness multimorbidity may actually affect them continuing on the trial so we're very careful about that I mean life happens things happen but we you know we do our best to make sure it's the right person for the study yeah thank you Jackie um, Mark I'll come to you and then I'll add a point in there too oh Mark can you hear us your hands up there. Uh, just about, yeah. Um, uh, just two things I, I wanted to draw attention. I'm, I'm sure they're already covered. One is the legal thing associated with clinical science, the hugely long and complex guidelines and conditions and terms, etc. This has been raised several times, I think, I'm sure. But it's actually quite important because it can be quite overwhelming for someone to, to certainly be confronted with a 30 page document that has mm -hmm. to be signed particularly when pharmaceutical companies are involved. And the second point, I think, is highly relevant, is ethical, ethics. What mm -hmm. if a trial, such as the pro dopa trial that I've been on, was very successful, but NICE is obviously not going to fund it. And the drug company is not, um, is the drug company obl obliged to continue there? Would it be ethical to take a very successful drug away from, from people? And, and this is particularly interesting in the consideration of um, the judgment, the guidelines to uh, the NHS, um, that when this trial was ongoing, 
the efficacy was so great that people guessed they were on the real drug as opposed to not being on the real drug. In the, in the double blind trial, which was held, I was on an open phase three open arm, but it's a double blind trial. The, the NICE assessment committee first concluded that the, 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 the science behind the trial was not reliable because people had guessed they were on the right drug. I think that's just nonsense. Uh, that, that you, can, you cannot aspire to have a successful drug and then wanting it to fail during the, the, the trials. So things like that, I think, would be really useful to also consider in this document. Yeah, absolutely. And and the kind of the aspect of placebo and the reliance on that as uh, as the kind of key factor when actually, as you say, that maybe is the the wrong bit to focus on. Um, Joe, I'll come to you, and then uh, Jackie. Yeah, sorry, I don't seem to be properly logged into my new version, okay. so I can't use the automated tab. <laughs> That's sorry right. about that. Um, and I may have missed this when I was out in the dark there, but um, it, the, I presume from what's just been said that this is aimed at people who are going to who are considering taking part in a trial. So I just wonder, are we going to be designing a few more pages? Because it <clears throat> it seems to stop, yes. you know, at, at the point where you just actually want more information because you, you you want to know what happens once you're actually on the trial. Yes. Absolutely. So th what we have so far is very much me kind of going, this is what we could start with. But right. act okay, actually the well. content, we very much want the content actually to come from groups like this and from these discussions. Um, and then we, we can keep kind of growing it as organically as possible. Um, because I didn't want to, there was lots of, I did have a, a thing about, oh, do I add this? And then I was like, oh, hold on, then it's going to become too much of my voice. Um, and actually, I really want to make sure that it's it's the voice of the group and the voice of that um, lived experience. I also think it would be, um, personally think it would be really valuable to have, to try and embed some of people's lived experience within it. So having um, as much of people's stories as they're willing to share, whether that be stories of trying to get into a trial and, and it not being successful or or being uh, being in a trial that then the drug stops being available. And, you know, I think the more we can um, personalise this and really kind of ground what we're doing in that lived experience, I think the more powerful a document or powerful a resource it will be. Um, mm -hmm. But absolutely, this is very much just a, I suppose, really a sense check to go, am I on the right lines of what we said we were going to start making? Are we are we happy that this is kind of in the right direction? Um, mm -hmm. And then happy for you to start tearing it apart <laughs> in the most positive, constructive way. Um, and then, because I think over time as well, like whether we kind of go, okay, well, we've got a kind of final draft for now that we think we could start looking at utilising this. I think it's it's always going to be a moving document because the the types of study that come in are are, are changing. The type of um, people that are eligible is obviously changing. Um, and also, although obviously we're talking about kind of clinical trials and drug studies and things like that, one of the challenges um, for people that maybe um, even with all the all the kind of best mismarpling in the world, we go actually you're not eligible. Sometimes actually it can mean you're not eligible for quite a lot of the clinical trials because they often have, by their nature, very, very strict criteria. Um, and some of the things that might exclude you from one might also exclude you from several others. And so I think it's important that we also focus or add some emphasis to the fact that there are non-clinical trials um, that are also available, but also why why we have groups like this, why we have patient public involvement, why we have partners in research was about saying, actually, everybody is eligible in this in this space. You are welcome. You are there is no criteria here. There is space to be heard and to have an input so that even when I think sometimes you can feel like, oh, I'm not getting to do um, the thing I'd like to do. But actually, there are other ways that I can feel involved and feel like I'm um, contributing. And I think it's certainly my role, I suppose, is to stay mindful of that and mindful of um, alternative ways to be involved. But yes, absolutely, we 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 can grow it in in any direction you like, really. Um, can I check, Mark? Is it a new hand or is it a previous hand? I don't know how to switch it off. Oh, that's fine. I can take it down. That's fine. I just didn't want to take it down. And then you go, no, I was trying to make a point. Um, <laughs> So I suppose um, I'm aware of time, and Stephen, I know that you were saying that you, you need to head off um, sharply too. I suppose what I'm thinking in terms of where we go next with this really is actually helping me decide what we need to, what to start adding in, 
what to start filling the gaps with and what you'd like to see. Um, and that can be suggestions here, or it could be that you kind of go away and you look through it and go, I would love to see this, 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 and this. And then we start filling it in. Um, and I think that's, again, we can keep, it's really good to be mindful of what's going on elsewhere so we can go, actually, we don't need to rewrite this ourselves. We can we can signpost to other resources and other, um, other opportunities. Um, but also, as I say, if I think if people are happy to maybe share their experience of of these things, whether that be in video form, whether that's in writing, we could, you know, we could embed a video for the online version. We could do a it could be a, a my story kind of thing. There's lots of different ways we could do it. Um, but I suppose really it's about kind of saying what can we do for you that that you think would would build on this this resource and make it useful um, because that's that's why we're here. That's um, it's I'd, I would love for you you all to feel as much kind of ownership and and um, power to create it as in a way that works best for you. Um, Stephen, do you want to come in there? Yes, um, I guess what would be useful is to know what's the main purpose of this thing that we're creating. Um, so in let's say in six months time, once we've created it, we look back and we say, oh, this one thing is wonderful. It now achieves the following things that we set ourselves as goals at the very beginning. And so the sort of overriding question for me is what's the purpose of this document, which will then guide what we then put into the document? Um, and so that's sort of my question. But let me just put my hand up as a volunteer and say, look, I'm quite happy to share my story. But what I would want to do before I share the story is to sit down with maybe yourself and Jackie and just to go through that story to say, you know, what are the learnings that we can take from this and what do we want to put in the book about this? So I think maybe it could take quite a long time. I think if we just rely people on throwing bits of information onto a, a virtual pad somewhere, there's nothing like a face to face meeting to crunch through some knotty issues. And maybe that's what we need to do to get this thing off the road. Absolutely. And that might, I think you're right, that could be a really good um, thing to kind of try and focus on next. And actually, when I, when we looked at um, pots of possible funding, one of the key reasons I was looking at pots of funding was to do some in-person workshops on this to be able to really, um, you know, and a bit like, uh, Nicole, what you were saying, done for the surgical project, to really be able to, you know, bounce, bounce ideas off each other um, in a meaningful way. Um, in terms of the, our, I suppose, our original goals with with this bit of work, where there's that real focus on could having a kind of companion guide like this improve the experience of people seeking to be involved in research? Is would it make their experience of being um, trying to be involved or being involved better? Um, and assuming that's the case. Are there, is it something that, yeah, when we look back on, we say, because of this, this and this within it, actually, this has led to whether it leads to more participation, whether it leads to actually a shift in what we say is important in terms of Parkinson's research. Is it that actually um, we say that, you know, there's a real ethical issue here that's being missed around people's experience of being dropped or people's experience of losing that support and more research and more funding needs to be directed to how do we how do we really impact this um so i think there's quite a few questions to think of and then maybe even as a group prioritize in terms of what do we think that kind of get yeah, our key priorities now in six months time in a year's time would be um so that we can also kind of uh keep ourselves right with that with that trajectory um, because obviously up until now, part of it has been getting to know each other um, and then building on that in terms of what this could look like. Um, I don't know whether non-virtual or virtual hand went up first. Don't know whether Joe or Nicole. Okay. I think Nicole, Nicole went up first, I think. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, just a quick point, really. Uh, uh, it would be very useful maybe, and maybe this is something we can do in the um, uh, potential in-person workshop, is the current portfolio of projects that you have what resources are provided to participants before they start or during uh, because i'm assuming it may be there it 
it may vary quite a bit because these are not all projects based in Scotland, are they? They're, there's some of them are in the England and Wales and so forth. So it might be good to just get an idea of what people are provided in the first instance and then to see any gaps uh, in the market in terms of what we can fill in. I, I think definitely the post-trial support aspect would be one and obviously the other priority area in terms of uh, if you're turned down would be another but you know it would be good to kind of get a, a, a an idea of the landscape of, of the projects that you have maybe don't go crazy in terms of looking at everything but you know you've got a good starting point because these are the projects that you are supporting anyway through the NDN. That's a really good good point and a good idea and something that um, maybe kind of we can work on in the background, um, Jackie, and things around kind of the, portfo the portfolio, what it involves, type of research, all those kind of things. So I know we, we kind of capture anyway, but maybe with a bit more of a targeted focus to what we could learn from from this in terms of support. So yeah, I think that's a really good idea. Um, and so now I'm going to go, Helen, could you pencil in a meeting between Jackie and I? <laughs> um, <laughs> Jackie's going oh no more work um it's I'm happy to focus on that one uh Joe. um yeah I was just wanting to say that I thought that as an overarching goal your slide um number five uh, sort of why are we making the guide seemed quite a good set of uh, well it's a sort of cumulative objectives leading to the the last point that our partners in research think that the point of this could be that we're removing some of the not necessarily distress but kind of stress and anxiousness um by creating enough information so th i think the kind of overall objective looks to me like it's there um but then also that uh we need to um maybe just drill down a bit like stephen said into how how we do that um and to follow up what nickel said that the sort of addition additional pages that that I would see page seven leading into is sort of one about what happens at the start and exactly what um, Mark said, the kind of shocking nature of the length of the forms you have to plow through um, and the reasons for that. But then also I think a page on involvement of either family members or your support supporters is, is something important. And um, the point Nicol made about what's in each programme, we did get a quite a good well, a part of the, the the leaflet that we got for Brendan's trial was about involving your partner and making sure they came to some of the meetings because they'd have to help with what needed to be done at home and so on. And also because they have this insight into changes that are happening in you that you may not necessarily recognise. And so their role is really important as well. So we need to kind of keep that up there too. Absolutely. I think it's really important that we don't um, lose the the importance of both perspectives, sometimes together and sometimes actually separately and and the different things that we can learn, um, because, you know, we're not the, the famous saying of nobody's an island. You know, you have that that whole village of people that support you and, and that, um, that recognize different aspects. So I think that's absolutely, um, absolutely the case. Um, Mark, did you want to come in there? Yeah, just uh, I really appreciate what Stephen said early on, saying what do we want to achieve? What what, what do we actually want to achieve? And I think it's a really good question because and the second is follow up. What are the measures that will tell us whether we're achieving it or not? Mm -hmm. So what are the metrics behind it? And I think that that's a really good question. It's not about what do we want to tell people, what do we want to inform them. But what do we want to achieve? We might want to achieve something like um, a reduction in dropouts from the trials or an improved um, recruitment rate or speed yeah, or improved um, understanding by people participating in it, things like that. So I, I thought, Stephen, I really like that approach. And, uh, I so that was what I just wanted to answer. Absolutely. And, do you know, I think there's I'm trying to I can't remember the acronym, but there is definitely a, a template that's quite useful for the kind of setting out the here's the aim, here's the here's what we're trying to do, here's what we're trying to answer um, that I will try and remind myself of which template I'm thinking of um, and then send it around as homework inevitably um, for you all. Um, but yes, absolutely. I think having a real um, targeted approach and a real um, accountability to what we're trying to do and then whether whether we're achieving it is is really important because in the same way that we talk about managing expectations of a clinical trial 
it's also important to be aware of our expectations within um, PPI work, within within this type of work, um, because you don't want to feel like you're coming along and then going, I don't really know where we're going with this or what the point is. And, you know, that's not that's not a feeling that we want to uh, perpetuate. Stephen, do you want to come in there? I'm aware that you'd, I know you have to go shortly, yeah. but I'll let so, you come in. Well, apologies. I'm just going to have to dash off. But the final parameter in any project is what, you know, what's the length of this thing? Do we have a target date when we'd like to have this thing packaged up and ready to roll? And I don't need an answer now because I don't think okay. we can. <laughs> but that's certainly one of the things I will be asking is, you know, what's yeah. the end date? And I'm sorry, guys, I'm going to have to go. Bye no, no, not at all. Thank you so much. Take good care. So I think the plan for going forward, um, if it sounds OK with you all, is actually maybe to, um, after this meeting and if, um, tomorrow is going to be my catching up on on writing up notes and things, um, but maybe to to have a kind of set of questions that might be um, that we can send out um, to the group that that talk about those kind of what would your preferred kind of key um, outcome of this be or what would you most like to see from this work or uh, what do you think we should be measuring? These kind of questions that I will frame so much better than I just did um, as a bit of a kind of survey to you all, but also, um, yeah, thinking about the, the the points that Stephen made, but then also, do we want to put, firstly, a deadline, but what kind of um, timeline do we want to put on this? Because obviously, we're very flexible and it's about uh, working with the group and with what the group wants to see. Um, and at a pace that works for the group, but it is also it's always helpful to kind of go right. Well, we want to be able to at this in this many months' time say we have version A, and let, let's go and see if this is helpful. And then okay, hold on, we might need to. I think there's always an element when you co-create something or just fancy way of when you make something together. Um, the, there is a bit of trial and error. There is a bit of kind of going. Oh, actually, do you know what? Now we've seen that that we don't like it it doesn't work and you know there's there's needs to be room to to change things up um based on what the group want um so i will put some of those notes thoughts comments together um and then send around some possible homeworky questions um which you are welcome to respond to in an email you're welcome to think about and bring to the next meeting um if that's easier Equally, if you'd prefer having a bit of a one to one to kind of talk through some of these things so that we can make a note of them, that's also absolutely fine. Very flexible to what works. Um, but I think that sounds like the best next step in terms of how we both continue developing this guide, but also get a, a wider sense of what this project could look like over over the kind of next few months. Um, because as I say, up till now, it's been really kind of going, is this what we want to focus on? And it seems like it is, which is good. Um, and now it's just kind of um, operationalizing that, I suppose, and making making it clear how we move forward. Um, does that all sound OK? It's a lot of content. I'm aware of that, um, but hopefully interesting and something that <laughs> hopefully you don't go away and go, right, actually, that sounded like nothing like I wanted to be involved in and I'm never coming back. Let's hope that's not the case. Um, but, you know, with all of this. We're, we're learning from from each other and keeping keeping very open to that. And it's been really helpful um, to hear all of your perspectives and your experience and to know what else is going on in those other areas so that we can complement that and work together on that. So yeah, just to say thank you so much for coming and sharing your thoughts. And I'm really excited about um, building on this. I think, um, I think it's gonna be something that's gonna be really nice to be able to see grow and evolve um, and to be able to share with people, which is also really exciting. Um, so thank you very much, Jackie. Is that, is Are you able to share what you've already developed so far? You know, in an email, yes. can you send us a copy yep. of that just so we can see if that's okay? Yeah, absolutely. So right. I'll send, we'll resend what we've got so far with some questions about where we go next with it. Okay. Um, and then with potentially some kind of easy fill-in options, or even it might be that we turn it into a quick survey if that's easier. Um, we can try some, try some different options. I'm happy to play around with different ways of um getting feedback um and then yeah go from there that all sound all right great thanks Rosie. lovely yeah. thank you so much i really appreciate all of